Should YouTube get rid of subscribers completely? That's the first question that we answer on today's episode of Creator Support. We also talk about Emma Chamberlain being on the cover of Rolling Stone. Then we answer the question, how do you get someone to watch a video more than once? And then we talk about whether or not you should start a second channel and when is the right time. Welcome to Creator Support, the show where we answer your questions about the business of being a creator. If you make it to the deep end, you're in for a surprise today. All right, we're kicking off with a question that I've been thinking about quite a bit. Happy it was asked in the subreddit. I think a lot of creators that I've been talking to um, are curious about this. So this comes from Feasible Creative. It says, should subscribers be removed as a YouTube metric altogether? The classic YouTube vanity metric. With the rise of shorts, the validity of a creator's credibility based on subscriber count is almost zero. I have 6,000 subscribers, but over 50% stemmed from one semi-viral long-form video which isn't my main niche focus anymore. As such, my new videos are less likely to be clicked on by these individuals. It would be interesting to have ghost subscribers cleared once per quarter. Perhaps users who haven't clicked on a creator's video in a while would be prompted to unsubscribe or opt in to stay subscribed. This could cause a lot of variability in subscriber count though. What are your thoughts? Wow. It's hard for me to think about getting rid of subscribers yeah. after 12 years <laughs> of really trying to hit 1 million subscribers. Sure, yeah. Different but channels, by the way, just so different channel. Didn't yeah, take we us have, 12 years on this channel. On this channel, yeah. uh, on YouTube, yeah. if you're watching, we have almost 20,000 subscribers yeah. on the Creator Sport channel. On our main channel, 1.2 million subscribers. Mm -hmm. And for me, hitting 1 million was so important. It was like mm -hmm. this North Star that it was one of the only ways I could understand if I was even progressing as a YouTube creator mm -hmm. over time. But now that we've surpassed it, I I do understand, especially with shorts, how it feels kind of gamified. There were times yeah. last year when we gained, you know, 100,000 subscribers off of a single short. Mm -hmm. Are those people really tuning in? I don't know. Yeah, I think we saw a correlation between that and increased viewership across the whole channel. Um, but that was just like also increased visibility of our brand and we were keeping things on the same track. But I think this question is really interesting. And the second half of it, I want to start there mm -hmm. of what if you could clear out and have people opt in that suggests like that's something that we do on our newsletter. So yeah. like pretty regularly, if people aren't opening the newsletter, we will, you know, either send them an opt in link or, you know, remove them if they aren't reacting to anything. Cause what we want on the newsletter is very active subscribers. What we want is that when we send you an email, you want that email. That's a very different scenario from YouTube because right now the sub box is not really that active, at least for me as a consumer. I'm not, I'm not going to the subscriptions tab to find a new video. I'm looking at the home feed because it's more interesting. Like there's mm -hmm. more variability in what shows up there. And I kind of know when a new creator that, or a creator that I enjoy uploads a video. I just know. So I think the reality is that like the subscription notification is what's become devalued. Like views from subscribers is mm -hmm. becoming less and less because there's no real function. There was a time a long time ago where you would get an email that said like Colin and Samir just uploaded a video. Yeah, Remember it, that? It used to really mean something. It used to really mean something. And as it became less valued, creators did speak up mm -hmm. and they were like, wait, why have I been trying to gain subscribers if it's not actually right. translating to actual viewership? Yeah. And there is a reality here where YouTube subscribers, they're not paying mm. if you subscribe to someone's YouTube channel, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? That's a different type of relationship of like, sure, I'll subscribe yeah, or yeah. I won't subscribe, but YouTube's going to serve me the video anyway if that's what I want, if that matches my viewing behavior. Right, exactly. I think a more interesting metric to put on someone's channel would be how many returning viewers are watching the mm -hmm. channel. And that's a metric we have in the back end. Yeah, metric of community. In our dashboard, which is like how many people watched more than one video yeah. in that month. Yeah, I think um, one of the most interesting things about launching the Creator Support YouTube channel has been the views from subscribers. Like, you know, we have around 20,000 subscribers on this channel and each episode, you know, hovers between 15 and, and 20,000 views. And majority of those are from subscribers. Mm -hmm. That's a really special thing that I think is pretty unique right now that we're experiencing. Different from our main channel. Way different. Way different, right? Our main channel has 1.2 million subscribers. Subscribers who have come along for the journey across the last six years of varying types of content or varying formats. And, you know, we also are a lot of times with our videos hitting recommended, hitting 
you know, browse features, a lot of viewership from, from different parts of YouTube. Um, so we have a lot less viewership from, from mm -hmm. subscribers there. Some months it's in, you know, could be, we could do, you know, 15 million views in a month with 10% being from subscribers with 1.5 million being from subscribers. Yeah. I do think that's interesting to bring up that for us, this show creator support mm. is a community based show, right? It's consistent. It's every Thursday. Yeah. And it's about building a routine with all of you who are listening and watching. Yeah. It's not necessarily about the title, about mm -hmm. the thumbnail. Yeah. And that's similar to, again, our newsletter. Uh, it's like a routine-based and mm -hmm. what we call a permission-based environment where like you subscribe and you give us permission to send an email to your inbox because you want that. When you subscribe to, you know, a YouTube channel, again, nothing, yes, maybe you can turn notifications on and you can get a notification when someone uploads, but it's like, it's not really that relationship of like, I'm giving you permission to every time you upload, notify me and let me know and put it in my sub box. That does happen, but it doesn't feel like that's the relationship. You still, no matter what, as a creator, have to figure out how to stand out to your viewers and make sure they click, even if they've subscribed. Like, you still have to do the additional step Unless you're the type of, you know, creator that no matter what, people click on your video. Should new creators still ask audiences to subscribe? Yes, because I think we have not moved past the point where subscribers have lost their social currency and their business currency. Mm -hmm. So I think the reality is if you're in the business of being a creator, you know, if, if we ask someone to come on our show, our podcast, and they look and, and we have 1.2 million subscribers on YouTube that's going to mean so that's going to signal something to them immediately right versus if we have 3000 subscribers mm -hmm. and that social currency i think still still matters um whether or not it should it does and additionally when it comes to like sponsorship or you know advertising all of that everything about like the industry currency it still has to do with subscribers that might change i would urge creators to focus on views per video as like the metric that you're tracking, retention, like are you making videos that people want to watch and are they coming back? Like mm -hmm. are they returning to watch? But the industry still focuses on subscribers. So like you probably still need to care about it. Yeah, something that we track more so is comments, mm -hmm. especially on engagements, yeah. greater support Yeah, on these episodes. We're really looking at the YouTube channel to say, did this episode actually drive people to comment and say something? Yeah, we're, we're at a point in our career right now where we're looking for active viewers, not passive viewers. We're not looking for, you know, someone who's going to subscribe because they liked something we did, but then never engage again. Yeah. We're looking for people who are engaging on a regular basis. And that's, that's the work that we're doing across all of our different media platforms, right? Whether it's newsletter, Instagram, YouTube. And I think that's also why we're like building in the direction of, of community and something that we've talked about, but is now coming very soon is our Discord. Whoa. Discord server. We've just signed on some mods. We're going deep right now. The mod squad. The mod squad. We have a Discord chat with the mods, prepping for some great channels based on all of your guys' suggestions. Um, but that's going to be an environment that, again, it's like even more active. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like funneling through. Like, okay, here's here's like the broadest sense of people who, who are interested in being educated about the creator economy, hearing stories about other creators. Then we go, okay, what about people who want to go every week and have their questions answers? Here's creator support. What about people who want to chat with each other and go deeper from a community perspective? Okay, there's the Discord. So it's like we, we kind of are continuously now exploring where are the most active subscribers? Where are the most active viewers for us? Yeah, and part of the reason of that is because algorithmic growth is fleeting yeah, many times. totally. It's a great way to find new people, but it's not a great way always to retain people. Mm, yeah, I think... Uh, a creator who has built a mass audience on YouTube and seems to be the type of creator who can upload anything and people will watch Emma Chamberlain. True. Grace the cover of the Rolling Stone creators issue. Yes, she is the second creator to grace the cover. Mm -hmm. Mr. Beast was first. Yeah. And I asked you this morning, I said, did you know it was going to be Emma Chamberlain? Yeah. And you said to me, could it have been anyone else? Yeah. And I would ask everyone who's listening and watching right now, like, could it have been anyone else? Where people wouldn't have said, who? Yeah. Or why? Yeah. Or someone who potentially, you know, has some level of, of controversy surrounding them or has some, some type of backlash connected to them. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know that it could have been anyone else. Now, I also want to acknowledge, I think Emma deserves to be on the cover. Absolutely. Yeah. 
I think that's another reason why it couldn't have been anyone else is because I think Emma deserves to be on the cover. I think Emma is, the, the reason why I think Emma deserves to be on the cover is because she has shown us the roadmap of uh, evolution, mm -hmm. where someone who started on YouTube um, vlogging and kind of innovating in a way and showing us a different side of, of YouTube and then building into saying, where does that fit today? Where do my interests fit today? And exploring what that means in the in fashion, in entrepreneurship with Chamberlain Coffee, um, back on YouTube, completely new style. And then on with a Spotify exclusive show, essentially taking her vlog and subject matter that was in her vlog and converting that into a solo podcast. And I was watching that this morning and, and showing my wife the podcast. She was like, she asked the question. She said, doesn't she not make videos anymore mm. when she saw her on the cover? And I was like, well... It's a it's a valid question from her that like she's not really uploading YouTube videos anymore. But I was like, but she's she's absolutely still a massive creator. Like a weekly podcast episode on Spotify that's in both video and audio form. I don't know how many people that's reaching, but I'd have to assume it's the quite third a bit. most yeah. listened to podcast on Spotify. Yeah, so I, like that's massive yeah. amounts of reach and arguably even deeper connection with an audience than a vlog. Yeah, and. I'm sure Rolling Stone is still trying to figure out what the criteria is to put a creator on the cover. Yeah. But in my opinion, if you're in the offices of Rolling Stone, it's about finding someone who dictated culture on the internet, stylistically, mm -hmm. uh, from a format perspective, tonally. Yeah. Like when she started vlogging on YouTube, the environment on Instagram and YouTube was very like prim, proper, mm -hmm. overdone. She broke that down. Then she defined a editing style. So like mm -hmm. not only is she talking about vulnerable things like mm -hmm. pimples on her face, sure. she defines a new edit style that then gets like taken by the platform. Yeah. Everyone starts replicating it. Mm -hmm. Then she's like, wait, this is kind of boring now. Yeah. Shifts and does something entirely new. I was watching her her podcast because it's in video form on Spotify as well. Yeah. And it's, you know, relatively innovative in the way that she's sitting on her bed, she's talking into a mic. Uh, but it's jump cut and it's just her for like 45 minutes. Call Her Daddy does this sometimes and, and has done it really well in the past. But I don't know how many single person podcasts there are that are in the top 10, top 100 pods. Like that's just Emma. Mm -hmm. It's not an interview show. It's not a chat show. One person every week. Staring you in the face for an hour. Pretty impressive. So yeah. yeah, congratulations to Emma to being on the cover. Also for the second year in a row, we were uh, in conversation with Rolling Stone. I don't mm -hmm. know what our feature looks like. We were not on the cover, maybe one year, you know, not featured <laughs> on the cover, but one of the names on the cover. Sure. Because there's a list of names on the cover. I looked. You I looked like, for are us. We, nope, nope. Okay. Yeah, nope. definitely not. All right, about definitely 15 not. creators there. Nope, not us. Not us. Yeah. Um, I will say the last thing I want to say yeah. about the, the write-up, the article mm. about Emma, there was something really interesting in there. It talks about when she goes on stage with Spotify, with yeah. the executives to yeah. talk about anything goes. And she was talking about how she doesn't use any scripts. Mm. Now in those situations, they're generally scripted. When you have like an executive from yeah. a tech platform, yeah, yeah, yeah. a creator there, sure. we've been in some scenarios like that where you're given scripts and you mm -hmm. kind of adjust them and, and work them out. And it was really interesting that, you know, she said, I'm not going to use any scripts. And then after, there's a quote in the article about after she gets on stage with Spotify and she goes, I didn't nail it probably one of my worst performances. <laughs> but she goes, at least it came from a real place. Mm. And I think that's really interesting. I remember saying to you, uh, after doing an onstage appearance similar to this and being like, I feel like I'm failing at being a version that's not entirely me. And I would rather fail being 100% me yeah. than fail at a version that's not me. Yeah, I agree. And I really resonated <laughs> with that and respected her for being like, I don't use any scripts. Mm -hmm. However this goes, it's going to go. But no matter what, at least I'm being my truest, most authentic yeah. self. I think there's also a level, I, I really like that, but I think there's also a level of acceptance as a creative person that um, I don't think I had when we were, you know, kind of in the thick of, of growth. And even like only now in my maturity have I gotten to the point where I can accept that there's going to be um, on days and off days. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to nail it every time. Yeah. And that's an accepted reality. Whether it's like showing up to an interview with another creator, um, you know, doing this show, being live. Yep. There's just going to be days I'm not going to nail it. I remember when we recorded How I Built This with Guy Raz, 
I felt like that was an off day for me. I was so disappointed. Yeah. Personally. I just felt like I was off. Yeah. And that was like deflating because it was a show I always wanted to be on. Mm -hmm. But I just felt off, you know? And like, that's just gonna happen. And it's it's a really interesting uh, thing as you start getting into the consistency of creating on a regular basis and showing up every day as like the craft being yourself being present on camera or yourself being present on mic there's just going to be days you're not on. Absolutely. It's just going to happen. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's get to the next question. Uh, this comes from root seven, six, five on the subreddit. Hey, Colin and Samir, I've got a question. So it's related to last week's guest who did exercise videos. So I used to watch exercise videos myself and I found that I could rewatch that same video, maybe five, 10, even a hundred times over if I really like that exercise routine. And the only other type of media that I would consume that much would be a music video or like just music in general. So I'm wondering, is it possible to create an entertainment based video with the same amount of replay value as those exercise videos or music? It's a good question. Yeah, that is an interesting yeah. question. So what he's referring to is our uh, episode we did with Cassie Ho, uh, otherwise known as Blogilates, who started on YouTube by making fitness videos, grew a big community, mm -hmm. and then from there, you know, has branched out and launched two very impressive uh, clothing brands. But the question surrounds the replayability of videos. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this a lot. Yeah. There's one Yoga with Adrian video that I've done hundreds of times. It's a great yoga sequence. I feel good when I do it. I've done it hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. And I watch an ad every time. Yep. That video has millions of views. There's a lot of videos on YouTube that have a lot of replayability. Fitness videos have that because, again, you can come back to a workout. It's also like a transformation of self. You feel better afterwards. Mm -hmm. You start the video in one place, you end the video, you feel better. Yeah. Um, so you want to do it again. Music is the same way. You can watch a music video over and over again, probably less than fitness. But are there any other types of videos that you can replay at that scale? At that scale, I would say no. Uh, because even like a cooking video, a recipe, right? You'll watch it to a point and then you'll probably kind of know how to follow along. Markiplier does gamified videos mm -hmm. where you can choose a path to mm -hmm. go down at the end. But at some point, you're going to have seen every path. Very viral videos I've watched multiple times. Many, like many times over. One of them being Casey Neistat's Make It Count. Yep. I've watched that video. I, I can't count how many times I've watched that video. I would say... Scott Galloway's The Algebra of Happiness. I've mm. watched many times. But what is many times? Five? Yeah. yeah. Five, Five to, to ten six. Yeah. max. So I think um, in, it, like videos that inspire you. Oh, there's another video I've watched a couple times. Cody Ko and Noel Miller reacting to Mark McGrath. Yes, yeah. That's cringe. Yeah. That video makes me laugh. So I think there has to be for something to be uh, able to be replayed at that scale, there has to be a transformation. You have to start the video one way and then end it in another way. Like if we think about The Office, I can rewatch the dinner party episode of The Office an infinite amount of times and laugh every time. But I'm watching it because of the transformation I know it's going to create in me. I know I'm going to laugh. And when I want a laugh or to feel comfortable, then I look for that video or that type of video that I want to replay. Mm -hmm. So you have to leave such a profound transformation or profound impact on the audience that they want to experience it again. I think that's what you have to think about when you're creating videos that you want to be replayed. Mm -hmm. It's like, is this impact so profound? Did, they, did I make them cry, laugh, smile? You know, what did I make them feel to the point that they want to feel that again? Because mm -hmm. that's what's happening in a workout video you're experiencing something that you want to feel again. Okay, I came up with another one. Okay. Hit monologues me. for award shows. I'll watch monologues for the Oscars. That's got to just be you. And occasionally accepted yeah. speeches. <laughs> that one's... Other people, come on, they're funny. They're great. Dave Chappelle's monologue for SNL. Because I guess the question is, yeah, I'm not going to, I don't know why. Again, I'm just not there's a cap to it. it. Yeah, yeah. There's a cap to it. Yeah. It's nothing is going to be like fitness or like music. Sure. So that's the answer. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. But there answer. are some videos that move you enough that you want to watch them again. Yes. I'd urge you if you're listening or if you're watching, you know, drop yeah. a comment. What's a video that you can watch multiple times? Yeah. I just wonder, is it like, are any of Jimmy's, like Mr. Beast video, uh, are those like to be watched again or are those to be watched once? I think those are to be watched once, right? Yeah, I don't know if I've rewatched any of his videos. Even Emma Chamberlain, I think her videos are mainly to be watched once. Once, yeah. 
Um, okay, I wanted to to bring up this question um, because I, I think it's an important subject matter for us to talk about, and a lot of people in our community have talked about it this week. Um, this comes on YouTube from Time Warp Trio Eleven. It says, "Can you talk about the situation with Mr. Beast and Chris and the impact on the business?" Mm. That last part of it is interesting. The impact on the business. Yeah, I My, feel like that is sort of neither here nor there. Like the the business implications of someone choosing to be themselves and having the courage to be themselves. Yeah, is not really the discussion. Yeah, I don't think that's the question. Um, you know, I don't think that matters. Like, I, I think that that is, uh, th there's been some creators that I would urge everyone to watch uh, their reactions. Um, Ludwig, Hassan Piker, um, and D'Angelo Wallace, three creators that I think have made fantastic videos about this situation mm -hmm. and really encouraging the community to kind of be accepting and be open and be encouraging of someone to be themselves. Or if if you are, you know, uh, against it and discouraging uh, just to kind of like relax a little bit and, and like allow someone to, to, to be themselves. When I see this situation going on, like the thing that I, uh, get excited about is that Chris is very open and like in the conversation and not shying away from being in videos and very like, uh, upfront about, mm -hmm. about pursuing a way of life that, that, you know, he or they want to pursue. Like, I think that is just it's not easy to do that in front of that many people. Yeah, I think the the byproduct of this will be younger kids who perhaps grow up now more accepting or are maybe dealing with some uh, a situation similar where they're trying mm -hmm. to figure out identity. Yeah. And they see this on a really grand scale and someone sticking up for themselves and his friends sticking up for him and going, oh, okay, like, yeah. this is something that I will be fine. Like there, mm -hmm. there are, there's a roadmap for people like me. I, I was happy that, uh, in Jimmy's response to some of the commentary on Twitter, um, but really disappointed in Sonny V2's video. Yeah. I was very surprised that yeah. he was even, uh, like comfortable so, putting that out. Yeah. Sonny V2 put out a video that said like how, how Chris will soon become a nightmare for Mr. Beast, something like that. Yeah. Um, and Jimmy responded and was like, Chris is not my nightmare. He's my friend, you know, like just like relax. Uh, yeah, I was surprised that Sonny V2 put out that video. And again, like the whole situation, like, I think it's really hard. There's hundreds of millions of people watching and, you know, there's people looking at Jimmy as a strategist and being like, so what's the strategy here? It's almost like succession. Like, what's the play? What are you going to do now? Mm-hmm just keep on going. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't know. Like, yeah. what is, what do you, what, what do you want? What do you want the answer to this question to be of like, what's the impact on the business? You know, like I'm just going to continue. Yeah. It's a human being. Yeah. You know, like, I, I don't know. I think it's like, I think at some point we have to just look at it, stop analyzing it and just be open and accepting. Yeah. You know, so that's, that's my piece on it. I wanted to just, uh, acknowledge it and I acknowledge this question because obviously we've been getting a lot of questions about it, but like, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. This was something that you brought up to me and that I saw Sarah Dietschy tweet about and that I can't believe. Yeah. <laughs> which is Netflix tweet about the Love is Blind reunion. So they said, to everyone who stayed up late, woke up early, gave up their Sunday afternoon, we're incredibly sorry that Love is Blind live reunion did not turn out as we had planned. We're filming it right now and we'll have it on Netflix as soon as humanly possible. Again, thank you and sorry. This is so similar to a YouTube tweet of like, we couldn't get the episode out, guys. So sorry. It'll be out this week. Yeah. I just love that we're now all on the same playing field. Like once Netflix what? can do that, you know, we're all really just creators. But like what I, happened? I mean, you know. It's a live special. How did they not get it done? It's live. Production is difficult. You know, Frank yeah. Ocean was live at Coachella over the weekend. <laughs> and he went on an hour late. And how did that turn out? It's yeah. a difficult production. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. all production. It's yeah. just difficult. Mm. We're hearing from Jesse. It was their only. It was only their second time doing a live thing. But yeah, it was just. But it's Netflix. Yeah, it was just so like, interesting. That's a that's a yeah. YouTube creator yeah. response of sorts. Like like hey, it's my second time. Sorry guys. Like figure it out next time. Yeah. You know. 
it is interesting that it feels like we're all on the same playing field now. Like we're all uploading videos to the internet. Yeah. You know, like Netflix is uploading videos to the internet and they're trying to get like, maybe they had an ethernet problem. Like yeah. everyone just has similar problems now uploading video to the internet. Mm. Just thought that was so interesting to see that tweet. Yeah. It's amazing. All right. Video question from the subreddit about creating separate channels and when it's worth doing. Hey there, Colin Samir, long time viewer, first time Submissionary, I guess is what I'll call it. Uh, I had a question based on all your years of experience on YouTube and uploading. Um, recently, I've been putting a lot more effort into YouTube. And I've noticed after years and years on YouTube, on and off, um, that I've gotten more growth than I ever have. It's small growth, but still growth. Um, recently, I've been putting a lot more emphasis into indie horror games and basically screaming too much. But I've noticed that YouTube is also really focusing on podcasts and I have a podcast and I wanted to turn it into basically a vodcast. And there lies my question. I don't know if that's the same audience. Yes, it's still gaming, but is it the same audience that wants to watch a really fast paced edited video of me running through a horror game and screaming? Or should I make a second channel dedicated directly to this podcast? I don't know how I feel about starting a second channel, especially now that this one's starting to grow, um, or if I just really should just focus everything in one main channel. I'd love to hear your insights. You are an invaluable resource. Very nice. That's kind. Yeah, very kind. Okay, second channels. We haven't really talked about like having this second channel uh, for a couple months. We talked about it when we launched, yeah. but now it's been months which is so interesting. And it sounds like we uh, were in a very similar situation yeah. to this creator. Right, right. Because we found the majority of our success last year mm -hmm. and then immediately spun up a second channel, a second channel mm -hmm. for a podcast that we already had similar to this creator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think I, I like to look at YouTube channels as shows now. I think that that's very different from how they used to be and maybe different from how they're going to be in the future. But if you think about a channel as a show, now envision like, a TV show that you watch every week. Let's say Severance. Okay. Okay. So you click on, you watch an episode one of Severance, you go episode two of Severance, and it's a long form podcast. You'd be kind of like, wait, huh? What's the format of this? But it's the same characters, but they're now just doing and a talk show. That would trend on Twitter like crazy. That would be unexpected. And Someone cool. Yeah. Should do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's all about building expectations with your audience. Like you can absolutely set new expectations and be like on this channel, anything could happen. You know, it could be a podcast, could be that, could be this. But I think what has been really nice about this is like, this is a format that we were doing in audio. This is a format that we enjoy doing, wanted to bring it to video. There was absolutely conversation about putting on the main channel, even after we had had a couple of videos out on this channel. Yeah. But I think today I really recognize, especially building this community on this channel, like this is a subset of our audience and it's a different format. It's looser. It allows us to have different expectations when we're filming, different expectations of the post-production, different expectations from the audience. And it's really nice to have that all in a different place. Here's what I'll say though. We have the people and the process to handle it now mm. in addition to That's true. continuing to upload to our main channel, which is true. our main source of distribution. It's our main source of revenue. It's yeah. our main focus. That's true. Uh, we now have people in a process to handle this. I would say if you're not at that point and you're just starting to grow mm -hmm. on your one and only channel, you know, adding video to a podcast is significant. Very we significant. thought it was nothing. Honestly, we were like, we know it's going to be a lot, but like, come on. Um, yeah, we knew it was going to be a lot. We had conversations being like adding titles and thumbnails is going to be a lot adding video, like cameras in the room is going to be different. Mentally even responding again to now YouTube studio yeah. multiple times a week. Right, right. You know, there, there are things you have to think about. Mm -hmm. I think it's smart to do, but you have to have the process. Yeah. You have to know that you can handle the process and it's not going to derail the growth of what you've been working on on your main channel. You have to balance always. What's the strategic thing to do? with what fits into what I want to do, you know? Yeah. And don't let the strategic voice overpower your gut. You know, like if your gut is, I really enjoy this audio thing. It's been great. It's been a great way to have a deeper connection with my audience. Hmm. Keep the audio thing. Because audio also has a completely different energy. The people who listen, you know, 
have a completely different relationship to us than the people who watch. Once you add the YouTube video, you're concerned about people leaving. Mm -hmm. Or you can be concerned about people leaving. You're concerned about people clicking through. You're concerned about a public view count. You're concerned about all these different, you're concerned about subscriber growth. Like everything, all these new problems arise. And in audio, it's a very pure relationship. Like I'd be really curious for the people who listen to this show and have been listening and haven't really come over to watch the channel. How has the show changed for you? Has it changed energetically? And if so, in what ways? I'd be curious for you know you guys to. I mean, to tweet I think I'm not going to go fully into it, but I think no doubt in my mind, sure, it has changed. But I'm curious to hear from you know the listeners, okay. from the people, from the people, from the listeners. How has it changed from the Pod Squad? That's right. Yeah. So yeah, when is it worth doing? I think you brought up a good point. It's worth doing when you can handle the process, when you have enough of you know a clear cut. If it's going to be overwhelming to like upload two videos a week, which is it can be super overwhelming. Um, don't do it. Yeah. You know, keep it simple. You can always experiment and do four Mm -hmm. or something like that with the understanding that you may stop Yeah, after that. I've told that to creators before who are thinking Mm -hmm. about Mm -hmm. doing a podcast. I'm like, maybe just do it as eight episodes. Yeah. And where you'd be happy if you walked away with those eight. On Twitter, I I posted asking what are the biggest issues and problems that creators are facing. Also posted it on our YouTube community tab. And I was really interested that there's three core themes, which is maybe obvious, but the first one was time. Like people being like, I do this as a hobby or I have a full-time job. How do I find the time to create? The second one was about audience growth. How do I get more people to watch? And the third was about getting started. I have a hundred ideas, but I'm struggling to just get started. Hmm. I thought that was really interesting. Those were like the top three. They were just so abundantly clear that those were the three. Um, and then, I, could, I Okay, go ahead. No, say, go. I could see how getting started super it, overwhelming. is super overwhelming. I think had I been starting today where there is so much out there, there's so much to influence you, Yeah, I would be paralyzed by choice of what to make, how uh, the quality, how should it look when it comes out, mm-hmm. how am I going to be unique? I'm very grateful that we started at a time when I didn't even know what a YouTube creator was. Yeah. I did not even know, understand the concept of a YouTuber or that you could make money. Totally. You know, like viewership, all of this, the career was not part of the factor yeah. for me. And I think that allowed me to just create a little more freely mm-hmm. and then start to understand, oh, okay, there's, there's ways you can optimize this. There's ways you can find more people. There's ways you could generate more of a conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, I think just coming back to like a theme that we're finding in these last couple questions is like, don't let the strategy brain take over too much. You know, you kind of have to let go and just uh, create a bit more freely yeah. and like go with your gut on like what 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 is working, what feels good. Because once the strategy brain comes in, you can get paralyzed. Yeah. You know, once you're like, sometimes I have a uh, fear that I I'm doing something that to the broader community doesn't look or seem strategic. You know, I've just like, I don't want to be seen as someone who's not strategic. Interesting. And I think that a lot of creators are in that world when, you know, strategy is so heavily scrutinized right now. It's like, so what's the strategy mm. here? How did that work? How does that play into everything that you're doing? That's interesting. I've I've thought about that actually sometimes when I'm specifically about to send out a tweet mm-hmm. and I put it through a filter of, would this seem, does this seem like it's not strategic? Like it's too playful and fun and just like whatever and like. Yeah. It's not going to get any viewership. No one's going to respond to it. Am I too afraid to even send out this tweet because it's not yeah. strategic and, and you know, all totally. about educating creators? Yeah. And I think some creators are probably like, what? Like, just yeah. send out the tweet. Yeah. Like, there, there's too much right, paralysis you with the <laughs> strategy brain. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you have to really acknowledge that and be like, okay, I'm just going to, you know, there's I'm going to create freely and sometimes... I'm not going to be strategic. Other times, I'm going to be strategic, you know? And I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to think about how to build this thing, you know? But I'm also just a person who's expressing. <laughs> you know, like that's, yeah. that's also a part of this. And you and, may learn more from videos you upload that are not strategic. Sure, totally. There was one comment, though, that I thought was interesting where it stuck out to me out of the sea of the problems that people were uh, facing. And it's from uh, it's from a creator named Mahir Rathod, says brand building. And I thought it was really interesting because I saw a quote this week on Twitter from Warren Buffett that said, a brand is a promise. Very simple quote, very important. Mm. 
So I just wanted to suggest to this creator and everyone else, like brand building is incredibly important. I think it's it's a huge problem that you should solve as a creator. But with that quote, a brand is a promise, you want to think about what is it that you are promising and how are you keeping that promise? Yeah. Very simple exercise, but just I want to urge everyone to think about that. Like what are you promising to who and how are you keeping that promise? Super simple writing prompt for everyone. Okay. I think we're in the deep end. Are we in the deep end? Really? I don't know. How, I think, how deep are we? <laughs> oh my gosh. We're, <laughs> we're, we're deep. deep. Jesse just said we're seven, eight feet. All right. Yeah. I actually, yeah, I got to yeah, get yeah. something there. Yeah. One sec. I'll be right back. <laughs> Whew. Thought I was going to drown for a second. Good thing. All right. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, okay, I don't have a gripe this week, but <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to share a gripe from the subreddit. This comes from Throwaway YouTubes. It says, am I the only one tired of AI videos? This might be an unpopular opinion, but it seems like all anyone's making videos about right now. I don't recall crypto or NFTs being in their prime being this prevalent. I get that it's a huge shift in society, but the videos themselves seem pretty repetitive at this point where I'm skipping videos from my favorite creators because the title is something about AI. The second part of this, I think it's a huge shift in society, but the videos themselves seem pretty repetitive at this point. I kind of agree with that. How long are you going to keep that on? What do you mean? <laughs> I need it. Okay. For those of you who are listening, Colin is wearing a snorkel right now. Nothing from you. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to react to it. I have nothing. <laughs> do you feel this way? Are you tired of AI videos? No. Because I'm still in this mode of like really deeply wanting to understand it and figure out where it's going to go. How many videos are you watching in a week about AI? Well, first off, not YouTube videos. I'm consuming a lot on Instagram that can keep mm. me up to date mm. in a matter of seconds. Yeah, that I'm I'm interested in being yeah. kept up to date. I'm fogging up here. Yeah, my yeah, goggles yeah, yeah, are yeah, fogging yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm interested in being kept up to date, not necessarily. Uh, watching like a 15 minute video that's sort of gimmicky yeah. and incorporates AI. I agree. I think uh, I think the long form YouTube video is not as interesting right now to me as, about AI because there's been a lot of advancements in AI, but it feels like people are a little too opportunistic. Yeah, creating an AI video right now, not saying something novel or something yeah. different that I haven't heard. It's conversations that everyone's having because I actually do think this is a massively big shift in the internet. Yeah. Bigger than maybe even we all are acknowledging because we're like, this is a new thing. People are interested in it. We can make a YouTube video about it. But I actually think this is a massive shift in the internet. The uh, CEO of Google said it's bigger than the invention of fire. I completely agree. Like, I think it's, I've been playing with it to the point of being like, this is a societal change. Like mm -hmm. a, a, uh, existential change to the way we exist. Like we've just added a new species essentially that we can talk to. <laughs> we just yeah. completely. And I think you say things like that and we've been saying things like that in the office because yeah. we've been integrating AI into what we do. Totally. And it's, it's kind of scary almost how powerful it is and how much it's, we start to trust what it's giving it's us. It's planning my vacation this summer fully. Like I'm going... Now, somewhere based on what AI told me to do, like I am having a conversation with a machine that is planning a vacation for me down to the hotels I should stay at. Yeah. That's completely insane. Yeah, strange. So I agree that I think like the, some of the long form videos, if they're not novel are kind of like whatever, yeah. but the stuff that's coming across my feed, like the Drake weekend AI generated song yeah. was completely insane. I still don't, I'm like... I'm shocked by how much I enjoy that music. Did you hear that? Yeah. The no, Drake I did hear weekend there, one? There's a lot of music coming out uh, using Drake's voice right now. Yeah. And I saw a tweet that labeled it like this generation's Napster moment. Mm. You know, if you're a record label, if you're Drake, and all of a sudden your music is saturated, it's yeah. all over the internet, you're no longer controlling the pace of your output, what your brand feels like, what it sounds like, that's a terrifying moment as an artist. Yeah, it's crazy. Like that's going to have yeah. to be reckoned with. You can't just have a song that sounds like Drake, feels like Drake, is being listened to as if it's Drake. Mm -hmm. And Drake 
is not benefiting necessarily from it. Yeah, I think it's going to dictate a lot of like, I thought the song was good. What does that mean? Yeah, you know, like when Drake actually puts out music, are you like, not really as good as the AI stuff? Yeah, or even the pace at which people can put out stuff. Like, I don't know. Collab with artists that Drake would never actually collab with, right? You can do that on AI. I don't know. I just, I don't even know what to think about it. I do think it's like a monumental shift in in the world. Um, But yeah, I think the the reason why the YouTube videos feel stale is just because it's like kind of opportunistic. It's like, yeah, I got it. Like ChatGPT is going to control my day, control your day, make a fitness routine for you. You're going to cook based on it. It's going to teach you a new language. Like there's, uh, they're predictable. And I think something that we've talked about quite a bit is like what, what makes headlines is the unexpected. It's, it's not the expected stuff. If you upload a video that feels expected, you know, people might watch it, but it's like, got it. Yeah. You know, got it just from the title. Okay, this is slightly unrelated, okay. but I was watching a show this weekend on Apple TV called Make or Break. It's like a uh, behind-the-scenes sports documentary about World Surf League. Okay. And there was an episode on the rookies who had just joined the Pro League, and there was a great quote that said, uh, if you believe in the hype before you believe in yourself, you've got a problem. Mm. And it was about a surfer who, like, there was a lot of hype about this is, like, the next great surfer. Mm. But if you're that person who's like, even as a creator, starting to gain some traction and get hype, but if you don't have that core belief in yourself yet, mm. that like you can handle this yeah, and that you value your own work and your own worth, then like you may run into some problems. Yeah. I thought about that. That's good. Even for our own career. Like, yeah, I like that. When validation came for us, I think we'd already believed in ourselves. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. We were okay. Yeah. And, and not to say we don't waver in our belief. Totally. But it was important that we thought, yeah, okay, we can handle this. We deserve this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where the the classic term of imposter syndrome comes in when you're like all of a sudden you get a ton of validation and you're like, is this deserved? Like when are they going to find out that yeah. I'm not actually this good? You know, I'm not that actually this person. Yeah, I do think you, but that also comes to um, creating work that like feels very much you and comfortably you. Like the second you start, which I've experienced, creating work that's very uncomfortable to make, mm-hmm. but it's working, that's the worst, right? And we, yeah. we talked about that with Marquez of like, uh, you know, he's like the worst thing that can happen to you is a viral video because it's yeah. just like it says too much about you. It's like too much validation maybe uh, and you don't know what to do with that. All right. Do you have any gripes outside of your clear like <laughs> disdain, Dis- disdain for, for the snorkel that I'm wearing? <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know how to interact with it. it. It, You know what? It reminds me so much of the types of videos we made 10 years ago when I look at you that I like, I can't understand if we're back there or if we've come anywhere or if anything has changed. It's not strategic. You know? It's not strategic enough. <laughs> it's not just not strategic. It's just like, I can't like reckon. I can't even like understand it. You know, I don't get what's going on. You're okay. in a jumpsuit and a snorkel. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. this side of the table gets a little crazy. What can I say? Okay. I wanted to talk about something from the subreddit um, from 1972 Parzival. Now, this is also tweeted at us. I couldn't afford a published press hat, so I made my own merch. Now, this was a very engaged with post, zero upvotes, but a lot of comments on the subreddit tweeted out us. Essentially what happened was this creator brought in uh, the logo into Photoshop, printed out a sticker and put it on a mug. And I, I saw the video over the weekend and I was like, oh, that's, that's sweet. You know, this creator wanted, wanted like connected with the mantra and wanted, yeah. wanted it on a mug. Didn't, didn't think too much beyond that outside of like, uh, you know, kind of being bummed that if the, if the hat was priced too, like I started thinking about the pricing of the hat. I was like, yeah. oh, the hat's priced too high. Like how, just kind of thinking about that and wanting, wanting to make it accessible to a lot of people. Um, but a lot of the comments on the subreddit were like, this is not cool. This is like, you know, ripping off someone's, someone's logo, printing it yourself. And then I saw that perspective too. And I was like, oh, that also makes sense of like, I don't, I don't know that I would want someone taking this logo and printing it on a shirt for themselves or something yeah. like that. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting situation that that occurred in the, uh, in, yeah. the in, in the subreddit. It didn't bother me when I saw it. I yeah. think maybe if, if that person started selling it, of course, totally. I'd be like, yeah. well, we sell those stickers. I think so. selling it or maybe making the exact same product, but we don't sell mugs at the mm-hmm. moment. Yeah. You know, like 
they wanted it. Uh, we sell stickers at a pretty reasonable price, but like if you didn't want to pay for the shipping, you know, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I thought it was just an interesting scenario. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I think the only thing that would probably bother me would, would be if a company was like, it. was like our merch now says press publish and press publish yeah. is our mantra. I'd be like, well, uh, yeah, wait, yeah, that, that's what we're doing right now. So that's strange. Yeah. I'm happy that you connect with the mantra enough and like the feeling of that yeah. enough. And you know, I hope that we've priced the stickers and, and some of the products enough that you can support it and you can be a part of the community. Like yeah. I think that's, that is absolutely hope. So that, that was an interesting situation. How much longer are we going to go in the deep end? Because like this, these goggles are sort of like hurting my head. I think that's I'm, your choice, man. I, I just like didn't anticipate <laughs> having goggles on my head for, you know, upwards of 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, considering that, we should probably wrap. I think, yeah. I think, yeah, yeah. I think okay, yeah. we'll wrap. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Creator Support. And if you're watching, thanks so much for bearing with us while Colin wore a snorkel for the better half of the uh, back half of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say to all the YouTube listeners, you're welcome. You know? Yeah. If you do have questions for the next episode of Creator Support, you can comment them on this YouTube video. You can tweet them at us. You can post them in the subreddit. And again, coming very soon, you'll be able to post them in a Discord channel coming to a computer screen or a mobile app near you. All right. See you next week.